Father, it is good to worship you today. It's good to set this time aside and, Lord, to concentrate on you and to gather with family and friends here in the sanctuary or, or to be home live streaming. Lord, we feel your power. We feel your presence. And we ask that as we worship you and you are blessed by our worship, we pray that you would touch each heart today, that you would revive our hearts, that you would bless us and help us to feel your power and your presence in our very midst. Lord, in these quiet moments, hear our personal prayers. And now, Father, hear us as we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven.
Our scripture lesson for this morning is taken from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. Remember, Peter and John were just taken uh, sort of captive by the religious leaders and the rulers of the day. The church prayed for them. And then verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens, you made the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations raise and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did want what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place that they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had with the great power and the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work at them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed among anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means sons of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. All those who know that this is the word of God, say amen. 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 Our prayer list is uh, printed in your bulletin, if you'll turn with me. And once again, if you want someone on the prayer list, we're, even with the summer schedule, you have till Thursday morning um, to get it into the office for printing. Um, so we're remembering... Uh, Pastor Stott, is, are you still having your all set for your um, heart procedure? So we want to continue to pray for you and pray for God's healing for you. We've added uh, Ruth Hauser's two of her children, Carol and Rob, both have some health concerns and wanting to pray uh, for them. We've added Ralston Hedrick to our prayer list, uh, having a, a procedure this week. Um, We've added Linda Jones. Linda is in St. Mary's Hospital with health concerns, so we want to remember Linda. We've added um, Ann Mason, and uh, Ann was in the hospital this week at his home, and is doing great. I talked to her. She's doing well, but we want to just say some prayers uh, for Ann especially. We've added Joe Manginy's cousin Gary with cancer. And so we want to remember him. And under special concerns in your bulletin, we've been praying for a little Charlotte, you know, our two-year-old, and um, with leukemia, and uh, she had a bad spell yesterday. So they had to rush her to CHOP, and she might be in there a week um, having stomach problems and so forth. Um, so we want to remember especially um, Charlotte in our prayers. Um, so God, God has been good to us and he's blessed us richly. And so let's keep praying for those that we've uh, been praying for and see how he can heal in miraculous ways. Our prayer chorus is um, Joy of My Desire. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of uh, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We come for worship. We come to give you honor and praise. And so, Lord, as we gather with our family and friends here at Freedom, or Lord, as we gather in our homes, wherever we are, Lord, we want you to know that we love you and we worship you. And we set this time aside during a busy week, Father, just to concentrate on you. Father, we confess our sins. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of where we should be. But Father, we're so grateful and thankful that you forgive us of our sins, that you're a patient God, that you're a loving God, that you're a kind, passionate God toward us. So Father, we give you all the praise and thanks for your persistence with us. Lord, we have a deep desire to walk the ways of that you provide for us. We have a deep desire, Father, to follow you wherever you go. And so, Lord, in these days, difficult days, we ask that we can be true and faithful to following you and living for you. Father, we are very, very grateful for all that you've given us. We're grateful for our daily bread. We're grateful for our clothing, our food, our family, our friends, our houses, our transportation, our education, our, our health care. Uh, Lord, do we need to go on to let you know how grateful we are? And Father, sometimes we don't seem so grateful because we are going through some more difficult times and we tend to keep asking for this and asking for that and for this and that. Lord, Thank you for providing all our needs. Thank you, Father, for providing everything we need to exist and to be cared for. And we give you all the praise. And we know that even though we think that it comes from us because we work hard and we do certain things, we know that all good gifts, Father, come from you. And we give you praise and thanks. Father, we continue to pray for the United States of America. We pray, Father, that revival would hit our land, hit our government, and that, God, that great things would happen in our country spiritually. Father, we're thankful for its birth that we celebrated last week. We're so grateful that we live in this basically free land. We know it's a little messed up right now. We know there's turmoil. We know there's confusion. But Father, we just pray that in these days, you would draw us all closer to you, closer as a nation, closer as people, God. And so Father, we also pray for the condition of the world. We pray for the those in Ukraine. We pray that your peace and your angels of protection would be upon them. And we also pray for their provisions. Lord, we pray for the Russians and those that have become victims of war. Father, we pray also, Lord, for the other situations on our globe. We've turned into people created by you, into people created by you, hatred and bitterness Lord we know that that's Satan working in our lives and so Lord set us free set us free from the things that bind us that we might continue to be your servants and Lord we also pray for those in our body that we've mentioned we pray for Pastor Ron that you'd be with him and he has his procedure this week just bless him Father and heal him be with Ralston Lord, and we pray that all would be well with his situation. We pray that you'd be with Linda Jones and, and touch her in St. Mary's. And Father, 
heal her body. We thank you, Lord, for being with Ann Mason, and we're glad she's on her way to recovery, and we pray that she would know that we love her and care for her. We pray for Joe's cousin, Gary, that you would heal him of his cancer. We pray, Lord, that uh, all would be well. And Father, we ask that you hear our prayers for little Charlotte down at Chop with Leukemia. Hear our prayers as we offer them individually to you. Thank you, Father, for hearing these specific prayers and the other concerns in our hearts. We give you all the praise. For it's in Christ's name that we pray and his people said. So we welcome you to church today. Good to see you. This is our first Sunday where we're sort of like in our summer mood. Um, if you notice, just to clarify, some of you get a little confused when we just have one service but uh, during the summer we're, we're keeping with the two services so we have the 830 service as well as the 1030 service so if you have to go somewhere you might want to pop into the 830 service it's a little briefer than this service and uh, if you're on vacation uh, please bring and when you go to other churches their bulletins anything you can take no sense in reinventing the wheel, and if they're doing something cool, uh, we'd like to see it so we can plug into certain things. But it's good to have you at either service, and uh, this is our first week without our choir. Um, so if you'd like to sing one Sunday with a little ensemble, um, just see uh, Beverly. Oh, she's waving at you. We can't see her because of the organ anyway. <laughs> But if you see some fingers, just see her, and uh, she'll tell you about their practice. Um, but um, anyway, God's been good to us. Does anybody have a word of praise today? You'd like to give some praise of something that God's doing in your life? Um, we'll give you a microphone, and you can share as you stand. Yes, we have a word of praise right here. We got mics all over. Donald, it's behind you. There's the microphone. You could have just gone. Uh, it would have been okay. Yes. Wait one minute. Is the microphone working? I have a new grandson. Perfect. Oh. Grayson James was born July 31st. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> and Marge. Yes, I'd like to thank you, Norman, for allowing us to have the entire year to study the book of Revelation. It was, um, to me, it was an outstanding opportunity that was gratifying and humbling and enlightening. Um, and I must praise the ladies who were in that group. They were consistent, they were encouraging, they were there every week. We had six with perfect attendance for the entire year we had a couple who only missed one and another couple who only missed two. But all in all, that group was such a blessing to me and I just can't praise the Lord enough. He has written us a marvelous, marvelous book and he has given us so much encouragement that I wanna say with Billy Graham, I've read the end of the book and I know how it turns out. We're going to be okay. And we do want to uh, thank March. That ladies' Bible study went an academic year. And most Christians, you know how it is. They'll stick out three or four weeks and then quit. And almost 30 ladies came the whole year. And uh, 
you know, it's been a tough year recovering from the virus. And, uh, and of course, I'm personally we thank Marge because in the midst of it, she, she lost her husband and uh, she kept teaching. And uh, Harry would be proud of you for doing that, I'm sure. But thank you. Okay, someone else have a word of praise. Anybody else have a word of praise? Yes, D, right here at the front. I want to thank you. Thank the Lord for Marge. She is such a devoted teacher, and I learn so much from her and all the research that she does. She goes over book after book, and uh, she just is exceptional. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Someone else uh, across the aisle. Yeah. I want to thank the Lord, and I'm so very grateful to see my husband be able to stand and walk around and say hello to his friends. I'm really thankful for that. Yes. Had a rough year, but and we're glad to again uh, say of how singing again. Thank you. Yeah. Someone else. I just want to share with us. I just give thanks and praise to Almighty God. A lot of you know it's been a tough year for Ellie and I. This procedure I'm having Wednesday between the two of us since last July, we've been in the hospital eight times. And Ellie still has some things ahead of us, but we're making progress. Thank you for your love and prayers for God's healing touch. Uh, we deeply appreciate it. And God's healing touch for each and every one of us in a variety of ways. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Very good. Well, we haven't shared much in the last couple of years, so I hope we can do more of that um, so we can see how blessed we all really are. Um, I think we can stand and greet each other as we sing and greet each other. <laughs> We welcome you today. We ask that you sign the ritual of Christian friendship. The rosebud on the communion table announces the birth of a, a great granddaughter to Millie Edgemont. We congratulate her on her great granddaughter. And how many greats is this now? And. I said to her, all those greats, well, when you're having that many grandkids, but congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Uh, congratulations. Um, so I'd just like to highlight, um, you can see the King's Business throughout the week. Our, our men's Bible study meets at IHOP, and th that meets throughout the summer. And um, if you like to sing Sunday morning and you can't sing in the choir and like to be in the ensemble, they meet Thursday night at 645. So please um, especially note that. Um, during the summer season, on Sunday mornings, we're doing a series starting today on revival. And so you can see on the cover of the bulletin, the seven Sundays and each scripture and what we'll be preaching on. So you're welcome to read ahead and we can go from there. Um, know that the office is open every day. I'm always available. You can call me on my cell number. The summer things are a little different even without the past illnesses that we've gone through, um, but uh, we're preparing and getting ready for a full fall. And so that should be uh, most certainly
great and wonderful. If you have prayer requests, call so they get to uh, to the printer in time. And um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a buzz. I, God has been good to us. And at this time, you may now present unto the Heavenly Father his tithes and your offerings. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the joy and the privilege of giving back to you. It's an honor of all that you give to us. But Father, now we take a percentage and above and just give it back to you to spread the kingdom of Christ. In his name we pray, amen. amen.
have found the pleasures I once craved. It was joy and peace within. What a wondrous blessing I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. And it's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. No, the half has never yet been told. I have found the joy that fills my soul. Oh, the waves of glory roll. It is like an overflowing well springing up within my soul. And it's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. Yes, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. No, the half has never yet been told. No, the half has never yet been told. You know that every preacher during the course of a year, maybe two years, they always preach at least at some point on the early Christian church. You know that, don't you? Um, usually it's about this time of year because Easter is past. Christ has risen from the dead. He's made his appearances. He's ascended into heaven. And uh, we remember then... Um, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in his fullness. It, he always existed, but he came in his fullness. And, of course, then the early Christian church took off. And so, so often at this time of year, something is usually said at some point, maybe the day of Pentecost or so forth, on um, the early Christian church and how it's different than the Christian church of today, and, and we all know that. But as we looked at today's text in Acts 4, we saw that Peter and John were um, uh, sort of semi-arrested or taken in by the religious leaders of the day for sharing the gospel and doing the work that they were doing. Well, they were then released, and where we picked up, on Acts 4, on their release, Peter and John went back to the Christian people to tell them what was going on. And uh, we see a little bit here what the early church was like. Um, we pick some key words out. When they heard what Peter and John had been going through and some of the persecution that they would be going through, um, we can see here, the scriptures tell us, when they heard, they raised their voices together. They raised their voices. And they were people that began doing what? Praying. Really praying. Raising their voices. Lifting up to God. And the scriptures go on to tell us, when they were done praying and talking with God about the situation of the persecution here, um, you know what happened? The scriptures tell us the building shook. Um, and the power of the Spirit moved in 
the power of the resurrection. Well, that doesn't sound like our church, does it? Something wrong here. Must have been wrong with the biblical church. Doesn't sound like many churches today. Suppose, suppose it was like this. Suppose, um, you know, the, well, there has been a crisis. We've been through a health crisis. And suppose I just say, okay, Wednesday night, I'm telling you, we're going to get together as the people of God, the church of God. I want you all here, and we're going to have a prayer meeting. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to raise our hands and lift our arms and all pray out. You know, most of us, if we call a prayer meeting, we usually say, well, I'll pray silently. But this is going to be a different prayer meeting. We're all going to pray. Lifting our hands, praising God, thanking him, asking him to bless, asking him to do th great and mighty things. And you know what? Um, and you know what I, I tell you is going to happen? After we're done praying, you know what's going to happen? The building's going to shake. These walls that you see around the sanctuary here at New Life, they're going to start shaking and shaking because the power of the living God, the Holy Spirit, will be in our midst. And let me tell you, great things will happen. And you know what? Because of the impact of all that, we're going to decide that anybody that's going through difficult times or suffering or having financial problems, it's okay. Because the more we have, the more we're going to give, the more we're going to chip in, and it's going to be, just like Marge says, ultimately okay in the end. Now, if I told you that's what we were doing here Wednesday night, you know who would show up? The same 10 of you that come to everything else. The rest of you would be saying, Levy's gone wacko again, and, you know, he wants us to pray out loud. That's a one strike there. He says the Spirit's going to be here and shake these walls. And it would really be a shame if the walls fell down, considering we just got the whole roof repaired last week on the whole church. So I'd hate for the walls to collapse when we have a new roof. But the early church was in touch with the Spirit of God. The early church is so much different as a whole to the church of America today. The problem is I think I could be wrong. I've been wrong once or twice. But like the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, we sort of lost our first love, didn't we? Um, like some of the other churches that maybe went lukewarm. You know, we've changed. The church is not the same church as it was when Jesus ascended into heaven and the church began. And so some of that's okay. Don't you like change? I like change. I like change in the government. I, I like change in the country. Don't you? You'd hate everything to be the way it was 200 years ago. You know, I'm really grateful to Ben Franklin. Uh, he brought lots of change. And I'm thankful that he flew that kite with a key on it and invented that thing, discovered electricity, because that has changed our lives, hasn't it? So it's a good change. As much as we hate computers, you love them sometimes, don't you? You know? It's like, what a change. Can you imagine? Can you imagine doing some of the things that we do now on computer by hand? I remember when I went to college and wrote a six-page paper, I spent more time whiting out my typing errors and then certain professors only allowed six per page because they'd hold them up to the light and count the, the whiteouts uh, on the page. And uh, then it depends where they wanted the, uh, the footnotes, uh, whether I had to stop typing um, and and uh, be able to put my footnotes there and still have a margin, you know. 
So when, when I hear college students talk about a paper and they're doing it on computer where you can just push this, paste this, copy this, move this, do that. Thank God for change. But the problem is with some of us as Christians, we've met Christ. He's come into our life. We become believers and we've changed since those days. For me, it was over 50 years ago when I became a believer. And I've changed. For some of us, our prayer life has changed, you know? Maybe we we prayed more. Because, you know, our lives are busy now. I can never figure this out, how we never had so many time-saving mechanical things, and yet... We're busier than we've ever been. And I wonder how those people uh, got on covered wagons and went from the East Coast to the West Coast and made their clothes, made their bread, made their this, did this. And even if you watch uh, some of the cowboy shows today, they were more spiritual than we are. Now, I know that's Hollywood. But just the same, our lives are so busy, what gets cut out so often? Our prayer life. How about our daily worship at home, you know, our reading of our scriptures? How about our stewardship? When you got saved, did you start tithing? And now maybe things are tough, you know? You just don't like pulling into a gas station right now, do you? Don't you just want to, like, pull up all the gas pumps, you know, and get violent or something? I did do that once a few years ago. I pulled in a Wawa. Thank God it was the middle of the night on, on the Roosevelt Boulevard. I was coming up here from when I lived in Philly. Put the pump in, pump the gas, and uh, got in the car and took off. I forgot to take the hose out of the car. I heard this awful noise, and I'm like, what the heck is that noise? And I looked, and I had a tail behind my car. I quick jumped out, made sure no one was looking, pulled it out of my car, put it on the pump, took the loose end and shoved it in somewhere in the pump, and I took off. That was easier to do than pay the bill now at the pump. How about our unity? Do, are we a unified people as Christians? Are we? I, you know? How about our burden for lost people? Do, do we have that like we had it before? It seems that we've changed. We've changed since we first got saved. And I don't always think it's toward the good. It seems like we've changed and maybe we need a revival. Maybe we need a revival in our personal lives, you know? Maybe we need a revival in our church. How about a revival in the country? How about a revival in Washington, D.C.? You know, um, revival so often today is a, a mis, uh, misunderstood word. You know, lots of people that um, aren't used to revival, the word revival, well, of course, like us, you know, if you go down south, you know what that word means. Um, since we sort of live a little bit in the heathen belt of America as opposed to the Bible belt, um, we don't have revivals. We don't even schedule revivals. Forget what God wants to do. We don't, you know, down south, we were always having revivals, Um, an annual fall revival, winter revival, seven days of preaching, special music. Everybody came every night to church. The college I went to, Christian College Asbury, we had a revival every quarter. Revival we, for to be revived. But as you get in more liberal areas, revival reminds people of that old Elmer Gantry type of preacher. You know, good old Elmer Gantry years ago about him. He was a, a hard-drinking salesman, and uh, he used Bible messages to con people. And he got hooked up with the nun, 
I don't know if you ever saw the movie or the book, or I just got hooked up with a nun, and uh, it was the good cop, bad cop. Elmer Gantry went around saying, to everybody, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And the, the sister would come up and say, but God loves you very much. You know, but we are going to hell. And so lots of people today think that's what revival is, going and hearing people condemn other people. Um, revival should be um, a constant within the church of Jesus Christ. You know, revival really isn't for unsaved people. Unsaved people, what they need is not revival. They need salvation. Christians, do I see a few out here? Christians, we need revival. We need revival because it's real easy to get into certain ruts. It's real easy to backslide. Revival is bringing back to life. Revival is to restoring us to the consciousness that we once had, to restoring us to a prior, previous condition in our life. Revival is spiritual awakening. And it's that personal revival that many of us so often need in our spiritual lives. Um, a heart returning back to the things of God and God's commandments. Revival. Revival is needed. Revival is needed here in our own lives, in our homes. It's needed. Now, I'm going to give you um, some symptoms that you, if you have that might tell you you need revival. I, you know, I am a doctor, so I am used to symptoms and diagnosis. And so here are some symptoms if you might need revival in your heart. You ready? Number one. If you in your entire life and you're asked to do some service for the Lord, but you're busy, you know, you just can't do this, you can't do that. When we start becoming complacent and pew warmers, thank God we don't fuse, we've got a problem. We then need revival. If maybe... Um, we have a lack of concern for the lost. We need revival. Shouldn't we get up each morning and say this? Now, you know, I'm a little dramatic, so just accept me. God, good morning. God, I'm your servant today. God, send me someone that I could share the gospel of Jesus Christ with today. Just send me someone that I can show them the love of God just one person will do God. You do that? How about um, uh, need revival when you have an unforgiving spirit? You know, sometimes it's hard to forgive people. Sometimes it's hard to love your enemy because that's why you're their, your enemy because you don't love them. Um, sometimes um, an unforgiving spirit Sometimes it's important to bury the hatchet. Problem is, some of you bury the hatchet in the person's back, and that's not a good place to bury the hatchet. Unforgiving spirit. Some of us are filled with pride. We don't want to admit that maybe we're backslidden or maybe we've sinned. or uh, You know, some of us are just filled with pride. Some of us... Um, We're just backslidden ourselves. And to admit that's very difficult. But when we start having symptoms like that, we need to say, we need a revival. We need a revival. I was really blessed, even though I grew up in this area. Um, I, I went to a church that encouraged us to go to camp meeting. So I loved camp meeting. My original church in Trevos was started as a camp meeting and became a Methodist church, Trevos Methodist. 
And, uh, but now as a high school kid, uh, we all went in the summer to, to camp meeting. And I was like, I sat among people that uh, we sang a lot, you know, we had Bible studies, we had youth activities, and, and, and we, we sang, and uh, people actually said, praise the Lord and hallelujah. I would kill a few people would start doing that. I would be so thrilled I would do anything. Instead, now if someone did it, I would just faint because I wonder what was going on with you people. But, you know, what's happened to us? What has happened to us? What has happened if somebody sings a great song or the choir does a great... We have great music here in this church. Thank you for today. Thank you. Um, what happened to... Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We've become, um, you know, Hollywood audiences. We give the clap. Isn't that wonderful? How about praise the Lord? How about hallelujah? Do you remember those days after you got saved and you were dedicated to the Lord? You were excited about the Lord? Do you remember those days when you came to church expecting a dynamic message, great fellowship, and spiritual excitement. How many of you felt that way on the way to church this morning? Did you drive in and say, oh, I'll leave you. I'll have a hot one today. You know, it's going to be the best sermon we probably ever had in our entire lives because God has a message to speak through him to us. It's going to be good. And how about that choir? Well, we don't have How about that ensemble? You know, um, you know, we're, we're going to leave this place humming those tunes all week and the soloists and the sound people. We should come in here with such expectancy and God will meet that expectancy. And then we leave here as the church of Christ proclaiming a message to the world. <laughs> Thank you. Hallelujah. You know... We're missing those days when we're glad we could go to church instead of the ball game. Now we're having difficult days. We're missing a few people that, because of our creation of live streaming, like to watch us in their pajamas with coffee rather than come and presently be here. And we love all of you. I'm looking at the camera. But you know what? people, and this is true, I'm, you know, there are too many defeated Christians today. There are too many discouraged Christians today. There's too many backslidden Christians today. There's too many depressed Christians today. You know, we should get up in the morning like we won the lottery. This is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day and I am blessed, and I can put my feet on the ground, and God send me someone that I can love and share my tough experiences with. God, send them my way. We don't wake up like that, do we? How many of you are saying to yourself, Norman, I'm not a morning person. Okay, so God will just have to accept that, right? Not a morning person. So we get up and we roll out of the bed. We all have to run to the bathroom, you know. Um, and we're still not real happy. So, um, well, Norman, you've got to understand, I'm not real sociable until after the first cup of coffee. And if I get that first cup of coffee, you might get a praise the Lord out of me. Give me that first cup of coffee. Things are changing. I said, I went to a diner that I go to this week, and I said I wanted a Coke. I usually, if I splurge, I get a real Coke. If I'm miserable, I get a Diet Coke, which I should get all the time. But anyway, so I said, I like a Coke. And so she went and then came back to take the order. Well, I drank the whole Coke because I like, I was thirsty. I drink a couple glasses of water when I eat out and a couple Cokes. And I said, oh, could you give me a refill, please? And she's like, oh, do you want it now or with your meal? 
And I says, oh, what, what, like, what do you mean by that? And she says, oh, we just had staff meeting this morning. And uh, she said, we're, we're limiting it because of the cost to two Cokes per person, one refill. And I was like, I guess I should have come yesterday. <laughs> she explained it very nicely, though. So I still loved her, even though her ex <laughs> explanation. Um, but I, I'm better after a Diet Coke in the morning than I am coffee. But shouldn't we be a type of people that wake up really and say, this is the day that the Lord hath made. This is a day that I will rejoice. Lord, I am thankful that I can walk. I have a problem right now. I go to the doctors next month, but I can still walk, and I'm not in pain. I'm thankful. But you know what? We don't do that a whole lot because we are Christians who need revival. America needs revival. You would agree with that. We need revival. Revival is bringing something back to life again. Revival is deeper than scheduling a week of preachers coming in and preaching and singing. Revival is something really that God does in our hearts and lives. And you know how we plan it? We don't form a committee at the church called Revival Committee. You know how we do it? We pray. We pray. We pray. And that's how revival comes to us and to our land. And re when revival comes, uh, what does it do to us? It will change your prayer life absolutely completely because you'll see the power of God and how he works in our lives. When revival comes, it cleanses churches from divisions and differences. You know, last week was my anniversary, 46 years, and you did a lovely job saying how wonderful I was. I really do appreciate that, Brian. But of my 56 years of being pastor in two churches, I'll tell you the worst thing is the fighting among church people and the picking apart of the preacher sometimes. It's a killer when you're on the other side. Revival heals wounds, heals divisions. Revival makes us more committed to spreading the gospel than being so picky about problems. Revival produces powerful witnesses in the body of Christ. Revival changes our lives. Um, I went to, to Asbury College, as you know, and it's now called Asbury University and a great Christian school. Right before I got there, uh, the school had a major split uh, because they threw out a president. Uh, they th uh, so... I got there during the midst of turmoil. It seems everywhere I go, there's turmoil. But I got there during the midst. So this turmoil. And all these kids on campus were saying, we're praying for revival. Revival will solve this division. Because it divided the entire town. Um, so they're telling me revival will solve this problem. So... Um, I didn't even know what revival was. I was a United Methodist. What do we know? I thought, oh, revival, okay. So I went along with everyone. I'll, you were praying for revival? I'll pray for revival too. Finally, I was there four months. They had a prayer meeting in my dorm, and uh, my friend who was a senior said, well, you come to the prayer meeting? It's in my room. We're having testimonies in, ch in chapel tomorrow, and we're praying for revival. I said, I can't, I have a midterm right after chapel, I have to study. So then um, the next morning I saw him in the hallway of the dorm and I said, how'd your prayer meeting go? He said, oh, we, we didn't stay very long. 
And I said, what do you mean? He said, God came in my room and said, I'm answering the prayers of the people at the school. I'm sending revival in chapel tomorrow. Told him very clearly. So he said, we didn't have to stay any longer. God told us it was happening. I said, well, I'm going to miss chapel. I have to take a cut because I'm studying for a speech midterm. And my friend, his name was Larry, don't cut chapel tomorrow. You, we weren't allowed three or a semester. Go to chapel. God is sending revival. I know what he was talking about. I knew enough from camp meeting, but so I went to chapel and... Uh, Freshmen had to sit in the balcony, as, you, uh, as I've told you before. It was the dean's chapel. He gave it up to testimonies. People started giving testimonies, and you know how it is. You know, some of the kids, the same people, sit, share the same things. I'm in the balcony looking down. The 50 minutes was up. The bell rang for us to go to class. Um, the trio of the morning were three lovely students who saying, fill my cup, Lord. They got up and sang again. And uh, the professor leading the chapel said, if there's anybody who needs to commit their life to Christ or recommit their life or need a revival in their hearts, come forward. I'm looking back there. There's another Asbury and except you went a few years before I did. I see her smile. Um, I was in the back in the balcony right over by the clock. They opened the communion rail and uh, as soon as the music started, hundreds went forward. Now I'm at a Christian school that's so strict. You went the I would have thought I was the only one that needed to go forward. And the f doors were there, and I could feel the presence of God. The Holy Spirit enter through the doors, and you watch the Spirit just move people out of their seats down to the ground. This was revival. God said, I hear the prayers of my people. I will answer them, and I'm going to change lives. And it helped make me who I am today, that revival. After about six hours, I went forward. We didn't go to class that day. Every night at about three in the morning, they would say whether there was class. We had no class. I was so thankful because I had a midterm that next hour. And you know what? Because we had assigned chapel seats. We had no class the next day. You know what? We had no class the next day. You know what? We had no class the next day. The service lasted for seven days and nights. So you get a little funny if I go past 12 by five minutes. When you sit in the presence of almighty God, time means nothing. And uh, my parents drove down for it over the weekend. I turned around there where my parents look at me. Um, I was supposed to go on a witness team the next six weekends after we got back to class. The weekends I was in six different states everywhere we went. We share what God was doing in our lives and revival was breaking out. You know, we need revival today. We need personal revival. We need revival in our homes. We need a revival in our church. We need revival in our nation. And the only thing that is going to save America is Jesus Christ and revival and the spirit of God.
Um, Dwight L. Moody, he was a you know, famous evangelist from Chicago, and he took a vacation to England. So he went to England. It was sort of like a sabbatical, and he was so thrilled because he didn't have to do all this preaching. He writes this in his journal. So um, he bumped into somebody, found out that the, this man found out he was talking to Dwight Mooney, and so he said, uh, oh, my church loves you. We've read your books. We read your sermon." Would you come and speak? So Dwight Moody was soft-hearted and said, okay, I will go and preach that next Sunday morning. So he went, and in the afternoon he wrote in his journal that they were the deadest group of people he had ever talked to in his entire life. And he continued writing and saying, but worse than that preaching to these people was before the service started, he promised he'd come back that night for the evening service also. So now he had to preach again to these people. So he went back for the evening service. And his journal says, halfway through the service, he wasn't even sure what was happening, but God began to move. And Dwight Moody said to this crowd, I don't even know if you understand what I'm talking about, but if you want to become a Christian, Meet me after the service over in this little room. He went after the service. The room was packed with people. The next day, Moody got on the train to go to Ireland and continue his vacation. But when he got off the train, there was a memo for him. <laughs> and the memo said, um, Pastor Moody, uh, pl please come back. Come back. Revival has just broken out got on the next train back. He stayed for 10 nights straight with services and over 400 people gave their life to Jesus Christ. And so he started wondering, well, why did this happen? How did this happen? You know what he discovered? There was an 80-year-old invalid widow named Mary Ann Adelard, and she had heard his sermons, and knowing that he had, was at her church, she was praying that revival would break out. It wasn't planned by a committee. It wasn't planned by any preacher. It wasn't planned. You know who planned it and got it going? It was an old lady that prayed, and God put it together. God put Is it right to pray for revival? Yes. We need to be praying for revival. Is it right to pray for revival? Is it right to expect it? Well, if you're going to pray for it, you'd be stupid if you didn't expect it, wouldn't you? Sure, we pray for it. We expect it. Is it right to be rejoicing after revival comes and be happy? Oh, yes, it so is. I am so weary of dead Christians that can't even smile when you say hallelujah or praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. That joy unspeakable and full of glory. I, I knew that song from before. So Bonnie was practicing before church. And I'm sitting here listening and thinking, man, whoever um, arranged that, it's so slow. And then she broke loose. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. You should leave this service today waving. I know some of you are scared about the virus. Hugging people, you know. I've done for three years everything the law said I had to do, tried to be very careful, and we need to be wise. But there comes the point when you're going to have to break from the law, and let's see, what do we call that? Trust the Heavenly Father to get you through difficult times. You know, you should be hugging people, caring for people, loving people. It's just the, the way it works. And that's what we should be doing. That's what we should be joyous. A little girl got saved at a church um, meeting, and the next week she got baptized at the meeting um, at the church, and she went home uh, Sunday afternoon, and she's so thrilled. <laughs> Jesus came into her heart. She was baptized. She's singing and dancing in the house, and her grandfather, who was a miserable cuss, 
um, came up to her and said, what are you so happy, girl? It's the Sabbath. It's the God's day. You shouldn't be happy. You shouldn't be all thrown dancing. Sober, you know, get a little somber and sober about all this. Well, the little girl was crushed. So she went out to the barn. She climbed on the fence, and she looked at the old mule that was there, standing there. He had a sad, droopy old face and bleary eyes, and she patted the mule on the head, and she said to the mule, don't cry, old mule. I guess you've got that same kind of religion that Grandpa has. I tell you, we need to get with it. We need to get with it and let the Holy Spirit touch our hearts and lives and start being happy people. You know, as my mother died when she was 88 and she got older, <laughs> she'd say to me, I can say that. I'm, I'm older, so I can say that. She'd say, I think she could say anything to anybody. And I said, oh, yeah, you can, Mom. Yeah, you can. But when you die, no one's going to like you. You could say anything you want. And I've watched people get older, and I've watched me get older. It's disgusting because, you know what, I, I hit 70, you know. And uh, you know what our co conversation with anybody is, is how many specialists you're going to and where's your aches and pains. You know, that's what I have conversations with people about. And not about their problem, it's, all, it's about my problem. You know, we, we got to get to the point where the joy of the Lord comes back in our lives and the excitement and the thrill of it. I shared this story with you once before. A Lutheran bishop tells of visiting a, a parish church in California. So he went there and he saw a banner on the wall of the church, huge banner they put up. Come Holy Spirit, hallelujah. And under, under the words were flaming fire like on the day of Pentecost. And the bishop was so interested in this sign. He's like, whoa, isn't this great? Then under the sign was another sign with an arrow. And it said, fire extinguisher here. <laughs> Too many Christians today are walking around with fire extinguishers. And God wants to turn you and the people sitting next to you in your church on fire. Uh, might be too much change. I'm telling you it's not. So, this is your homework assignment. See, I'm two minutes early. This is your homework assignment. You're going to do it? You're all going to do it? Yes. yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay. Every day, now, we, we, this series is for the next seven weeks. Every day, you're going to take five extra minutes and pray for revival. Can you do that? For your family, your kids, your grandkids, your church, your country, the White House, the Capitol. We're going to pray for revival. Okay? Now, I know that you might forget to do that. So, I've made something. I got it made. I didn't make it. Um, to remind you. You remember about six, seven years ago in the summer I did a series on why, and it was questions we asked God, why am I in pain, why am I this, and we gave you a button that said why with a question mark, and you just was aware it all summer, remember, wherever you went, on your purse, on your hat, wherever you went, and then when you were out somewhere and someone says, what's why mean, what a great opportunity to witness, right, you remember that? I still have my why button. Um, so we made another button. I want you to wear this button. I want you to put it in your house, on your curtain, in your car, on your hat, hat um, on your pocketbook or whatever to remind you to pray. And then if people see it, you can give witness. So this button says revival. Revival. We're going to pray for revival. And when God sends the revival, number one, we will know it. We will know it. 
and God will do great things in every one of our hearts and lives as we spread the gospel of Christ. Revival. Do you got it? Is it spelt right? Okay. Good. Oh, well, Bonnie did it, actually. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, as we sing the last hymn, the ushers will pass these buttons among you so you could take home and wear. So, if we're wearing this, of course, you might have it in your home. So, like, maybe if you came to church next week, I guess somebody should be wearing a revival button, shouldn't they? Or, and I know you might think, oh, I'm going to look so foolish walking around, let's see, the dynamic Oxford Valley Mall and uh, with this button on. Um, well, just see what you can do with it. But if anything, it needs to remind you and me to pray for revival. Amen and amen. amen. Revive us again. The hymn. We praise thee, O oh God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and... Okay, ladies, ladies... Hallelujah. Men, find the glory. Ladies, men, men. Ladies, men, everybody. Revive us again. We praise thee, O oh God, for the spirit of life who has shown us our Savior and scattered. Ladies. Man, find the glory. Amen. Ladies, men, everybody, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed. Ladies, Men, ladies, men, ladies, men, everybody, revive us again, revive us again, fill each heart with thy love, may each soul be rekindled with fire from a ladies. Find the glory. Amen. Find the glory. Revive us again. So you're leaving. I don't want to see tired faces. I don't want to see miserable people. If you're that way, go out the side door. Okay? I'm out the front every week. You're welcome to come out and greet me. May you have a blessed week. May you know how good God is to us. And even through the difficult times, we will get through them with his help. Go with the blessing of God. Amen. Amen. Hey, babes. Hey, you. <laughs> Let's cleanse every state. Hey, babes. Hallelujah.